Good morning. Liz Truss's first Chancellor lasted 38 days. This morning, we'll hear from the new one. But the worries about bills, interest rates and the economy are the same. This week has been chaos. You may well ask, who is in charge? Is she? Uh... We need to act now to reassure the markets of our fiscal discipline. He's certainly not anymore. Should the Prime Minister go next, Mr Kwarteng? Kwasi Kwarteng got off the plane to get sacked. Is the Prime Minister next, Mr Kwarteng? Do you have any faith that you'll be able to restore the financial markets, sir? Is it him, the fourth Chancellor, in four months? His first act was to ditch Liz Truss's plans. We're not going to be able to cut taxes as quickly as we wanted to, and some taxes will have to go up. Or are we all now at the mercy of the mighty markets? Don't prolong the pain. You wouldn't be the only one to wonder what on earth is going on. Oh, it's a great pleasure. Anyway. So we've one big question this morning. Who is really in charge? This morning we'll hear from the man tasked with saving the economy and Liz Truss's premiership, her new Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt. And as Labour keep hold of their huge lead in the polls, we'll hear from the man who wants to be in charge of business in this country, the Shadow Business Secretary, Jonathan Reynolds. And we'll hear from the husband and wife team who designed the first COVID vaccine, Pfizer, BioNTech's professors Ura Shahin and Oslem Terechi, who say a cure for cancer is within their grasp. And joining me on the panel throughout the programme is the chair of Tesco, John Allen, the trade union Unison's general secretary, Christina McInerney, and the former health secretary, now on the back benches, Matt Hancock. A very good morning to you. Now, throughout Brexit, throughout Jeremy Corbyn, throughout the last financial crisis, I'm not sure I've ever seen a week like the last seven days. A total smash up of politics and economics. A mess engulfing a new prime minister just weeks into her job. Also this morning, though, you will want to watch the interview with those two incredible beyond tech scientists behind the first COVID vaccine who now have hopes their technology could transform cancer treatment as well. That will be in about half an hour. But we've got to start with the political meltdown that it's been hard to ignore or to look away from. Matt Hancock, I know you've been in your constituency in Suffolk this week. What have people been saying to you about what's going on? Well, it's clear to everybody that this needs fixing, it needs sorting. We've got a very significant political problem and that's as a result of a set of policies that were uncosted and unfunded and uh, that approach was never going to work uh, and it hasn't worked and I'm very glad that the government is now committed to the sort of financial discipline that is absolutely necessary and bread and butter to any Conservative administration. And we can set aside, you know, once and for all these ideas that you can go for unfunded policies and that they might work. And it was funny, in the intro you said, the, who's in charge of the financial markets? Well, they are our creditors. They're the people who, who we've borrowed from. So, of course, you have to take them into account. You don't want to, but it's a reality. And we'll come to that a bit later, but you can see how the front pages this morning are doing more than just saying it needs to be fixed. Some of them are suggesting there might have to be a new prime minister because people in your party are. I mean, look there, the front of the Sunday Express revealed secret plot to oust the PM. The Sunday Times suggesting it's Jeremy Hunt in charge now. The Observer saying Tories in talks to oust trust. Now, John, you're the chair of one of the biggest businesses in the UK. What's been on your mind as watching the last few days? <clears throat> well, I think it's important, Laura, that we focus on how all of this is impacting on people. You know, I think the personalities and politics I'm happy to leave to everyone else to sort out. But the reality is that the movement in interest rates is now going to lead to much higher mortgage rates for millions of people. Mm predicted 7 million people facing doubling of their mortgages by the end of 2024. Um, 
lots of people I think are struggling with the existing elements of the cost of living crisis, food and so on. And I think we have a, you know, while the politicians are getting on with sorting the politics, we've got a moral responsibility to actually look after the people who in the real world who are being impacted by this. Christina, what would that mean? I mean, a moral responsibility? Well, I agree with John. It does feel that this is, uh, this is serious. This, is the, this isn't the time for the Conservative government to start playing, you know, um, musical chairs with who's in charge and who's not in charge. It's far too serious for that. And actually nobody voted for this. this is, they have no mandate for this. We've, got, we've had 12 years of a Conservative government and you know, Liz Truss comes in, not only does she trash the economy, she trashed their own party's record by the things that they were saying in terms of what's been happening over the past 12 years. It's time for a complete change of direction and to give the British public a chance to vote in this. Well, what's interesting this morning, inside some of the papers in both the Mail and also in the um, Sun, they're both suggesting, actually, we can look at those editorials there, they're not quite calling for Liz Truss to go, but they seem to be inching that way. And that's important because they were supportive of the Prime Minister. I mean, Matt, just hearing Christina and John, union leader and business boss, basically saying, you guys have got to just sort this out because people are suffering. Do you feel embarrassed? Well, I feel like it needs sorting. I think there have been signs that things are moving in the right direction. Uh, we're going to hear from Jeremy Hunt uh, later. What is absolutely critical is to get that uh, credible economic plan in place. You know, that's the bread and butter of conservatism is to have credible economic plans because what what we want to do is improve the life chances of but, people uh, but across the country just by as John was but, saying. but are you embarrassed by what's going on because i think a lot of our viewers will just have watched the last seven days and thought the conservative party is again in this kind of turmoil they can't sort each other out they can't get on they can't decide what they want to do and they're now contemplating changing leader well i do think that coming together and having that unity as a party is incredibly important. Um, so you won't hear me saying uh, things like that we need to get rid of the Prime Minister now and, uh, and all of that. What I think is that we need to get the plan in place and we need to bring the party together behind that. But to get unity, you need to earn unity and that takes leadership and that is what we're going to need and through we'll, tough we'll, times. We'll talk to you more about that later, but Christina. So this isn't about the Conservative Party, this is about the country and that's the problem we've got at the moment is the Conservative Party are only concerned with how will they survive the next election, how will their reputation look. I mean, basically they've lost the reputation of being you know, fiscally competent. And now is not the time for, the, for them to continue to play games. We need grown-ups in charge of the country. And that, sorry, is not, at this point in time, not the people who are in charge of the Conservative okay, Party. Well, tons more from you guys a bit later in the programme. But we've been meaning to say for a while, we've had a few things on on this programme. If you want to get in touch, we would love you to. You can email us at kunzberg at bbc.co.uk. We'd love to hear your ideas, thoughts on what they're all arguing about. And on social media, you can use the hashtag BBC Laura Kay. And if you're one of those people who likes to know what everyone else is thinking and get analysis as we go along, the BBC News Live page is there for you. You can see the address at bbc.co.uk forward slash news. Now, in a moment, as we've said, we'll hear from the Chancellor. Yep, the fourth one in four months. The man who's trying to salvage the government's reputation. But before we do, so much has happened this week. Your head might be spinning. I think mine has. So buckle up. Let's remind ourselves what has been going on. It was only on Wednesday that Liz Truss went to see King Charles after Prime Minister's questions to be greeted with this. Prime Minister, Your Majesty. Your Majesty. Lovely to see you again. Oh, it's a great pleasure. Anyway. Since then, things have gone from bad to worse. On Thursday, Kwasi Kwarteng went to Washington for a meeting of financial leaders just as his plans were taking a battering from the markets. He was sure, though, he was staying put. You'll be Chancellor and Liz Truss will be Prime Minister this time next month. Absolutely, 100%. I'm not going anywhere. But that night, he was summoned home on a flight to be sacked in person. Liz Truss hired his replacement, Jeremy Hunt, who we'll hear from in a few seconds on Friday morning but then took part in a deeply surreal press conference where she said her mission remains. Well, my priority is making sure we deliver the economic stability that our country needs. That's why I had to take the difficult decisions I've taken today. The mission remains the same. Does it, really? 
when the Chancellor has junked so much of her plan? Well, I sat down with the new occupant of number 11 and asked him who's really in charge. Well, I was pretty surprised, uh, to be perfectly honest. Um, I've been pretty happy on the back benches for the last few years, but I'm in public service. Uh, there is a very difficult job to be done right now. And uh, I talked it through with the Prime Minister and I wanted to check that she was happy that I'm totally honest with people about the challenge. And uh, we are going to have to take some very difficult decisions, both on spending and on tax. Spending is not going to increase by as much as people hoped. And indeed, we're going to have to ask all government departments to find more efficiencies than they had planned. And taxes are not going to go down as quickly as people thought, and some taxes are going to go up. So it's going to be very, very difficult, and I think we have to be honest with people about that. But the one thing I want to reassure families who are worried at home is that our priority, the lens through which we're going to do this, is a compassionate Conservative government. And top of our mind when we're making these decisions will be uh, struggling families, struggling businesses, the most vulnerable people, and we'll be doing everything we can to protect them. I mean, it feels that the financial markets have been pushing the government around. Do you think they're holding the UK hostage? Well, no government can control the markets. No chancellor should seek to do that. It feels a bit like they're um, controlling the government, though, the other way around. Well, there is one thing we can do, and that's what I'm going to do, which is to show the markets, the world, indeed, people watching at home, that we can properly account for every penny of our tax and spending plans. And I think for people who've got mortgages, who want to know that as interest rates go up all around the world, they're going up by the absolute minimum necessary in this country as well. Um, they need to know that we're giving that certainty to the markets. And that's really the most important thing to do over the next two weeks. But why do you think you have that ability to calm everything down? I mean, when the Prime Minister announced you as Chancellor, and when the Prime Minister said the corporation tax cut would be dropped, still at that moment, the cost of borrowing went up and the pound went down. Now, the markets have already given an instant verdict on her massive U-turn and indeed on your appointment. Are you confident the markets are actually going to believe you? Why can you give that reassurance? Well, I think, you know, for people uh, trading in markets, actions speak louder than words. Uh, the Prime Minister has changed her Chancellor. Uh, we are going to have a, a very big uh, fiscal statement a bit like a budget in which we set out the the tax and spending plans for several years ahead and that's going to be independently verified by the Office for Budget Responsibility. We've been honest that it was a mistake not to do that in the mini budget before and that is now going to be sorted out. Now I know that you believe in transparency and honesty. You said you, you told the Prime Minister that you would be honest. Um, where are you going to cut public spending? Well um, I want to be very honest about that, but it's going to be two weeks on Monday in the House of Commons. And they're going to affect every single government department? Every single bit of government spending is again on the table for potential cuts? I'm going to be asking every government department to find further efficiency savings. And can you today rule out dumping the other tax cuts that this trust has promised people? I'm not taking anything off the table. I want to keep as many of those tax cuts as I possibly can because our long-term health depends on being a low-tax economy, and I very strongly believe that. It sounds, Chancellor, like you're preparing the country for a period of real hardship when mortgages are going to go up, rents are going to go up, and public services are going to be stretched and squeezed again. I mean, this is a return to austerity, isn't it? Well, I was in the Cabinet in 2010 when we had that first period of austerity. I don't think we're going to have anything like that this time. But what, what wasn't say, happening at I mean, that period is we, that people were not seeing their mortgages yeah. go up, people were not seeing their rent go up, people were not seeing interest rates on the way up. Isn't this going to be worse? Because at the same time as public services are going to be stretched and squeezed, and I know you want to be honest about this, but people in their own lives are also going to speed their own costs going up and up and up, whether they're trying to put food on the table, trying to buy a house or trying to pay their business loan. Well, um, the two things that I want to reassure people is, first of all, when it comes to people's mortgages, um, it's obviously a huge worry. Uh, interest rates are going up around the world because of what's happening in Ukraine and um, the post But we both know specifically yes, more yes. here because of the decisions well, that have now been ditched. Well, if I take the difficult decisions that I'm talking about, that is the best possible way 
to stop interest rates going higher than they absolutely need to because of these global factors. So that's the best thing I can do to help people worried about their mortgage. For people who are uh, on the breadline, finding life extremely difficult, to those people I want them to know this is a compassionate Conservative government and we will be thinking about them at the top of our mind as we make these difficult decisions. But for people watching at home, we've already lost count of the number of U-turns from this government. And you've said very clearly this morning that much of what Liz Trust promised the public is now gone, disappeared, ditched. Why can people now trust anything that this government says? Well, she's been Prime Minister for less than five weeks. And, and I would just say this, that the central insight that she campaigned on during her leadership campaign and the reason that I am uh, honoured to serve as her Chancellor is that economic growth is the key thing that we need, unlocking that paradox so we can move from half to 1% economic growth to 2 to 2.5% two growth. But that's growth. like saying that everyone wants milk and honey coming out of the taps. I mean, everybody wants the economy to grow. What I'm asking you is why people watching at home this morning can look at what's happened at total chaos in the last few weeks. The Prime Minister again and again changing her mind about things. Why should they now be able to trust what she or what you are saying to them? Because she's listened, she's changed, uh, she's been willing to do that most difficult thing in politics which is to to change tack. And there's a second reason as well. You, you say it's, it's milk and honey to talk about wanting economic growth. Well what we're going to do is to show not just what we want but how we're going to get there. The start of that will be the difficult decisions we take a fortnight on Monday that show that we can fund everything we want and that we're doing what we can to keep interest rate rises low. But the second half of that will be the broader economic growth plans, the practical things that Conservatives understand can make a real difference and to our potential And you will go ahead, then you hope still to go ahead with things like easing planning reform, easing red tape on business. Those things are still going to happen, those parts of Liz Truss's agenda? Well, we are going to go through the whole growth agenda. You've talked about a couple of areas, but I could talk about the potential of our technology industry to be the world's next Silicon Valley, the potential of our life sciences industry to develop new medicines, uh, the fact that we have one of the world's two great financial centres. There are lots of things that we can do to turbocharge our economic growth, and that is a central part of what this government will be doing. The strange thing about this, and I have to say, Chancellor, actually, it's quite staggering, really, a few weeks into a new government to hear you this morning sitting, and for reasons you've explained very clearly, but basically ditching the entire thrust of what the Prime Minister wanted to do with the economy. Who's in charge? You or her? Look, the Prime Minister's in charge. And really? I, think it's in, yeah, I think it's important when you talk about ditching things, uh, the biggest element of that mini-budget was the energy price guarantee, where people's bills were heading for £6,500. That's and now going to be capped. Their, and we've heard from their, her about that on, on many occasions. That will make a difference to many people. But her promised tax cuts are now not happening. She promised public spending would not be cut. You're now saying very clearly, for reasons you've explained, that public spending might be cut. She has ditched central parts of her agenda. It's gone. She and hasn't. it seems you're set, setting much of the direction. She has changed uh, the way we're going to get there. She hasn't changed the destination, which is to get the country growing. I think she's right to recognise in the international situation, the market situation, that change was necessary, but she is absolutely determined to deliver that economic growth that's going to bring more prosperity to ordinary families up and down the country. But I know, Chancellor, you're not going to sit there this morning and deny that she's had to ditch much of her programme. You've explained why that's happened, but she has ditched much of her programme. And with so much of her agenda gone, to be blunt, some of your colleagues are saying to me, what is the point of Liz Truss as Prime Minister? The things that she stood for, the things that she campaigned on, have gone. And to be blunt about it, she's not there because of her rapport with the public. I mean, look at what's happened in the polls. Many of your colleagues think it's over and that you are coming in as a real sort of last roll of the dice to try to help her out of something that is done. Well, what I would say to those colleagues is two things. The first is that when I talk to my constituents in South West Surrey, what they want is stability. And the worst thing for that would be more political instability at the top, another protracted leadership campaign. I think that's the last thing that people really want to happen. The second thing I'd say is that when it comes to a general election, when the public 
give their verdict on this government. They will judge us much more on what happens in the next 18 months than what's happened in the last 18 days. But do you look at Liz Truss in the last few days and think, blimey, there's a confident leader who's got a grip of what's going on in this country? Well, I think she's been under extraordinary pressure. I, you know, I know how difficult that job is, having seen many prime ministers uh, at close range over many years. Um, but I would rather a prime minister who recognises when things need to change, is prepared to take difficult decisions. You know, to change your chancellor is a very difficult decision for a prime minister to take. She's been prepared to do that. You saw Liz Truss yesterday. Well, you spoke to her on the phone. How, how is she? I mean, you've, you've admitted it's, it's difficult. It's obviously a difficult time. Well, we know each other for very many years. Um, and, you know, I appreciate the, the difficulty of the situation. But what I also saw in her was someone who is absolutely determined to do the right thing. And someone who recognises that sometimes that means you're not going to be popular. Mm -hmm. And uh, someone who recognises that some of the ways she's tried to do things in the last few weeks haven't worked as planned. And, uh, you know, she's willing to change, to do that. She wants to get on with the job. And I think we should let her do that. You're sitting this morning and you're obviously determined to give a message to the country about stability. After the last few weeks, perhaps after the last few years, why would our viewers take seriously a promise from a Conservative politician that they can bring stability. The markets have created, have created turmoil in the markets. There's been Prime Minister after Prime Minister, the psychodrama of the Tory party leadership contest over the summer. Why can they think that you can stabilise things? Well, politicians can't control markets, and I think it's very dangerous when they start to try to do that. What we can do is speak with total candour about difficult decisions, and I appreciate that I haven't announced those decisions, but I want people to know that we are going to make those difficult decisions in lots of areas, going to affect lots of walks of life in order to do everything we can as a government to bring back that stability. Now, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. There's now two weeks in which we're going to go through a process of doing that. But I think what the country will see at the end of that process is a government that's willing to do the tough and difficult things to secure the long-term prosperity that we all want for our families. And just finally, if as many of your colleagues believe Liz Truss is on her way out, maybe in a few days, maybe in a few weeks, maybe in a couple of months, you might find yourself in rather an interesting position, a chancellor, the man next door who's had leadership ambition before. Would you run again? I think having run two leadership campaigns, and by the way, failed in both of them, uh, the desire to be leader has been clinically excised from me. <laughs> I, I want to be a good chancellor. It's going to be very, very difficult. But that's what I'm focusing on. What kind of chancellor will you be? A Nigel Lawson, a George Osborne, a what kind of character? Well, I'd be honoured to be compared to either of those two chancellors. Um, but I think right now what people want is an honest chancellor. They not had that? No, I don't say that at all about uh, my predecessor. He tried to do some bold things. Uh, some of them didn't work out. But we have a very, very challenging situation. And I think above all, people want candour. Jeremy Hunt, thank you very much. Thank you. Jeremy Hunt, who right now I think is on his way to Chequers to make this, try and find a way out of the crisis with the Prime Minister. Um, Matt Hancock, is Liz Truss the best person in the country to be Prime Minister right now? Well, yes, I think that the idea of yet more instability and a protracted leadership campaign is not what anybody's uh, looking for. I think people will be very reassured by that uh, interview with the Chancellor uh, because he was really clear about the vital importance of getting a stable uh, financial footing which is the bedrock of all good policy. But that wasn't my question, and I noticed that you said nobody wants a protracted leadership contest. A lot of your colleagues are thinking about something rather different. The Tory party behind closed doors thinking this is such a mess, we have no option but to choose somebody together and to try to install them to get yourself out of this hole. Well, I don't think we're there yet. I think that the Prime Minister needs to do three big things, and you can see from that interview she's already started to do the first. The first thing is an economically credible plan. And that means in a fortnight, the plan needs to show debt falling. It needs to show not borrowing for current spending. You can't borrow on the never-never. And if anybody thought that you could, the last six weeks have shown that that is totally impossible. Mm -hmm. The second 
is she needs to bring the broad Conservative Party into her government. To she reshuffle. Needs, she needs a reshuffle because the reshuffle that she started her administration with, uh, she took the decision, which was respectable but high risk, to only put in the cabinet people who had voted for her. And that means that you know, that's only a third of the Conservative Party in Parliament. There's a huge amount of talent on the back benches. I'm not talking about me, but there are many others who should be brought into government. The third is she needs to restore trust, trust with the voters, but also not slagging off the institutions that are the bedrock of prosperity. You know, organisations like the Bank of England, like the Office for Budget Responsibility, uh, like the IMF, you just can't go around being saying that they've all got it but, wrong. But Matt Hancock, that is a long list of demands. Yes, but the, And also the, some of your colleagues think that it might be too late. I mean, if you look at the long reading inside of the Sunday Times today, with a litany of chaotic, rude, on pleasant briefings suggesting the party is at each other's throats and that somehow her administration is broken. And I note that you said we're not yet at the point of a leadership contest. If Liz Truss does not do those three things that you've just called for, can she stay on? I think these are the things that she needs to do. But she's already actually demonstrated last but week. You are very clearly here setting out conditions. You're putting her on notice well, if she doesn't do those things. I know you're not saying she can stay. No, I'm not, I'm not putting her on notice. I'm not getting into the, uh, the, the question of changing the leadership. I do not think we need to do that because I think we need unity. But what we do need is this plan to be executed. Now, the Prime Minister has already made a very big shift in moving towards a position of economic responsibility and she set it out herself and her new chancellor is clearly and then on i want to bring, bring bring the others in but i must also say to you though, if people are who are conservative members and people in the right of the conservative party who voted for liz truss who wanted a big shake-up who have looked at the last 10 years and thought there hasn't been growth it's all been a bit kind of soggy center what do you say to them? Because they feel let down, they feel cross and betrayed. Yes, I, look, I understand that there are people who, in good, uh, in good faith, have made arguments about a, a sort of libertarian economic policy for many, many years. Um, and uh, you know, I've always been of the view that you need uh, fiscal responsibility first. Now, we've tested those arguments about uh, uh, economic libertarianism and, uh, and borrowing uh, with unfunded, uncosted tax cuts. I've always argued against them. It is now self-evident, and for a generation nobody's going to try that again because it didn't work. Failed. Because you, ha because you have to maintain the confidence of the country, of the financial markets, of the parliamentary party in order to govern. And so, therefore, let's get to the core economic um, values of all conservatism which is that you put responsibility first and you allow people to build well, prosperity. Well, I'm not sure it that. actually would represent all Conservatives. I think some people might disagree. But anyway, there's tons to talk about. Uh, Christina, we want to talk about what you're involved in as well. But first of all, I noticed during some of that interview, your, your eyebrows were shooting <laughs> up to the heavens. What was on your mind? I was just thinking we don't need to have a protracted uh, leadership election. We should just call a general election. But they're not going to do that, though, are they? I mean, is it well, realistic for people on the left seriously, to be calling for an election? Seriously, how can she stay on as Prime Minister? I mean, she's fatally damaged. She has no credibility. How she can distance herself after sacking her Chancellor, who the two of them worked in tandem to, mm. to present this ludicrous, huge gamble that, that almost ruined the country. And now she thinks she can stay on as Prime Minister. And I, I'm sorry, I think the Conservative Party has to you know, actually tell her that she, she just can't do that. But John, from the, from the boardroom, do you look to Westminster across from the city and think this government's got any credibility? <clears throat> I mean, it's hard to see it at the moment. I mean, I was encouraged by uh, the interview with the new Chancellor that, mm. you know, we might move into an era of economic responsibility, which were words that uh, um, Matt used. I mean, the implication of that was, of course, that we had an era of uh, economic Austerity. irresponsibility. Oh, um, but we may know, have contract. some very hard things coming we down may the do, track. But I, I think there are three absolute imperatives. One, we get to stability because that will start to pull interest rates down mm -hmm. and probably start to restore the currency, which is something that's really causing problems at the moment. Two, we actually look after the people who are currently most suffering. I've said that before. And three, that you know, it's not enough to talk about growth. Mm -hmm. People have got to demonstrate how they are going to achieve it. Let's We've had 10 years or more of limit poor relative but let's growth. talk about What's one of those that things that you mentioned there though interest rates so i want to hear play to people what the bank of england governor said yesterday about what might happen next 
we will not hesitate to raise interest rates to meet the inflation target. And as things stand today, my best guess is that inflationary pressures will require a stronger response than we perhaps fought in August. Well, that means, John Allen, in other words, they're going up and up and up. What's going to happen to house prices? What's going to happen to people's ability to, 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 to get a house? It will obviously rent? have an impact on house prices um, and in the short term on mortgages. But I think if in the long term we create the reality that we have got stability in the longer term, interest rates will, will come down, which is what we need, provided we have got a government, whichever party it is, mm -hmm that has got, is, can clearly demonstrate that it's going to be different in the future than it's been in the last 10 years. Uh, we have slipped down the economic, I saw a, a league table the other day that said, mm -hmm. you know, Ireland is now number four in terms of GDP per head. We are number 34. You know, we have way underperformed for a very long period of time and changing that is going to be difficult. Now, I'm, I'd like to hear from the government after they've got through the thing at the end of October, very quickly, what's their concrete plan for growth? Mm -hmm. I think Labour are already starting to set out a plan for growth. Mm -hmm. They've at least put their ideas on the table and you'll hear more and from we'll, Johnny and Reynolds. And we'll hear from Johnny Reynolds, the Shadow Business Secretary, in a second. But just you've acknowledged very clearly, at the, and it sounds like you're very worried, actually, about what a lot of your customers might experience mm. in the next couple of months. But Tesco, I think your, your projected profit, I think, is around two and a half billion. I mean, mm -hmm. would it be possible for big businesses to maybe absorb more of the cost to take on <coughs> more of the pain. We are. We've taken our forecast of profitability down. To We're trying down to, to two and a half billion. To, yeah, it was, which it was more than that. But you know, that's on over 50 billion of sales. It's under 5%. The, uh, there are a lot of businesses that are more than that. We're doing the very best we can for our customers to hold down prices. We're doing the very best we can for our colleagues. We're the largest private sector employer in the UK, over 300,000 people. We've just had another wage increase for the people on the mm -hmm. shop floor mm -hmm. because we recognise that they are really being adversely impacted. Well, let's talk about pay then. So, Christina, you are balloting your members at Unison, more than a million people, for the possibility of strike action. And there's a lot of worry about more disruption. Sharon Graham, one of your um, union colleagues at Unite, talking about the possibility of coordinated action. It's on the front page of the People newspaper this morning, talking about maybe a million people going out on strike this autumn. What's going on? Well, I mean, I genuinely think strikes are a symptom of a problem. Then they don't cause the problem; they're actually a symptom. And th this talk about, you know, it's the trade union. I mean, even the the the, the, the rhetoric we get, you know, trade union barons and all this. It's people who take strike action, and they do so once they've jumped through loads of hoops because we have very strict legislation. But what is it you're asking for then? So we're asking for pay to keep rate keep pace with inflation, or at least to give people a decent pay increase that means they can live. I mean, John's already said, him and I know several other of the, the big retail uh, organisations have given people two pay rises this year. Well, my members who work in the NHS, the nurses, the physiotherapists, the cleaners, the healthcare assistants, have been given £1,400 flat rate. That, that's, no, that's nothing for most of them. I mean, if you're in the, the kind of main band of, the main group of... Um, Sort of professional staff, the nurses, the physios, etc., the ambulance workers, mm -hmm. that's about 4% of a pay increase. But is it really it's what the country needs? I think some people watching this morning will be thinking, this is a really hard time. The last thing that we need are people causing disruption by going out on strike. And you know what, Laura, that would be true if it hadn't been for the past 12 years that we've had where pay has not kept pace with mm -hmm. inflation. So pay has been depressed, pay has been kept down. We were told in the first five years of austerity we're all in this together. Well, really, what has that delivered for public services? And this idea that, um, that somehow public services are a drain in the economy is so untrue. Public services help to revitalise the economies in local areas because if you give people who work their money, they'll spend it in, they'll spend it in Tesco. And just, and just briefly, if you do end up going to the picket lines, if there are strikes across the health service, would you want the Labour Party and the Labour front bench to be with you on the picket line? It's a total distraction, I think. Wasn't, I mean, that wasn't my question. Would it be helpful to your cause if Labour I, was with you? I don't think it would make the slightest difference. Well, I mean, I'd like them as a party to be with us, and I think they will be in terms of fighting for better pay. Whether they physically turn up on a picket line is immaterial because when you go on, on, on strike and you're on a picket line, it's not a game. It's not there for a photo op. It's there because people are trying to make a point and get decent pay for themselves. OK, thank you all very much for now. We'll be back with you in a bit and we'll be back to politics later. It's never very far away after all. But let's talk about something different that has affected every single one of us in the last couple of years. 
the number of people who have got COVID has been going up again. Let's have a look at the latest figures from the Office for National Statistics that say that around 1.7 million people had it in the UK. Now, that is not a reason for panic. We are not back where we were during the pandemic, and there are signs that this may have peaked this time around. But we all know how much the NHS is already stretched with us heading into winter. And as we talked about last week on the show, senior doctors have already been warning us to take care when visiting elderly relatives. That's Susan Hopkins, one of the government scientists who said, if you're not well, you should avoid contact with elderly people or those more likely to have severe disease. Yet nearly 90% of us have had two doses of the vaccine and the autumn booster programme is underway. And remember though, how it changed everything when the vaccines were first discovered. We've been talking to the remarkable couple behind one of the most successful vaccines, Professors Ura Shahin and Oslem Terechi, who worked on COVID and who still are working on trying to combat cancer. Do they think the pandemic is over? We don't have a crystal ball and we would not dare to, to speculate uh, in, in any way. Uh, we on our side make sure that we are prepared for anything which uh, could happen, uh, monitor new emerging variants, try to understand what um, extents of, extent of danger they could be or could not be. And the worst could be that a new, new variant could uh, come out and, and we have to, we can, we can reduce the likelihood by wearing masks because every individual who is infected is, uh, is um, a motor for the evolution of the virus. And should people then still wear masks in public places or when traveling, should governments still be encouraging people to do that? We are doing that. We are doing that, yes. We are doing that. Every, everywhere you go or in, just in your workplace, it's interesting. In public places uh, and places where there is too much of an accumulation gathering of people, in particular people who have been traveling, for example, uh, and had been exposed to potential sources of virus. On the COVID vaccine, how have you reacted to people spreading information against vaccines, saying that vaccines don't work, the anti-vax movement that's grown up? How have you responded to that? Uh, the way scientists always respond, to continue to do work, their work and to be very transparent with uh, their findings and, and uh, uh, the data. Are you concerned at how some of the nonsense has spread so freely? Should social media companies do more to stamp out on that misinformation? We, we need definitely ways to, to ensure that um, the true information is spread uh, faster and more effectively as wrong information. Yeah, so it is, you can even uh, ask, uh, uh, see that as a scientific challenge, how to ensure that uh, to, to mark yeah, uh, uh, false information and ensure that this type of information is not further spreading. Yeah. You're known around the world for creating a COVID vaccine, but seeking a cure for cancer has really been your life's work. What was your motivation to do that? Um, we are physicians by training and uh, when we were young we were treating patients, oncology patients with advanced cancer and uh, we experienced that most of the times we had to tell our patients that there was nothing we could offer them and we could only endure these sad situations because we were leading a double life. Uh, by day we were working on the cancer wards and in the evenings we, we were working as scientists, as immuno immunologists at the bench and were uh, encountering the beauty of science and of immunology. And um, uh, that was the motivation for us uh, to um, ask a, que a question, how can we bring science, our science, to the patients? Now, can you explain simply how the technology that you developed works? Um, so uh, mRNA acts as a blueprint and uh, allows you to um, uh, tell the body to um, 
uh, to produce uh, the drug or the vaccine, uh, which you would otherwise produce externally in bioreactors, for example. And uh, when you use mRNA as a vaccine, what you basically do is that the mRNA is the blueprint for the wanted poster of the enemy. In this case, uh, uh, cancer, um, uh, cancer antigens, which uh, distinguish cancer cells from normal cells. And uh, we first invested uh, our research towards uh, finding and defining those cancer antigens, which allow us to uh, paint the wanted poster. And then we used mRNA to um, communicate them to the patient's immune system. So if I've understood this correctly, your, your cancer vaccine would train the body to attack the cancer itself. Yes, to recognize and attack the cancer. The goal that we have is, uh, can, we, can we use this vaccine approach, this individualized vaccine approach, uh, to ensure that after surgery, directly after surgery, patients receive a personalized individualized vaccine and we induce an immune response so that the T cells in the body of the patient can screen the body for remaining tumor cells and ideally eliminate this uh, uh, tumor cells and thereby reduce or completely inhibit the, the metastatic relapses which would come two or three years later. And some people in the scientific community are, are still skeptical about whether MNRA will provide an answer for, for cancer. Is there still a chance that it doesn't work, it doesn't achieve the goal that you hope for? We I, I don't think so, because everything we have learned about the immune system and uh, about uh, what we achieve with a cancer vaccine uh, shows in principle the, the clear activity. We can induce those killer T cells, we can direct them. The question is how, with, with which type of other interventions do we need to combine this and what else do we need to tweak in order to have at the end of the day really patients cure, patients survival. When do you believe this might be, cancer vaccines might be something that many patients around the world would be able to access? We believe that, we'll, that this will de uh, happen definitively even in broader scale before, before 2030. The success of the technology you've worked on for years was proven to the world with your COVID vaccine. Could a positive of the pandemic actually be that you find a way of defeating cancer more quickly than you otherwise would have done? Uh, yes, this, this is actually very interesting. The, what, what we have developed over decades in uh, cancer, uh, for, uh, for cancer vaccine development, has been uh, the tailwind for developing the COVID-19 vaccine and, and uh, now the COVID-19 vaccine and our experience in developing it gives back to um, our cancer, cancer work. We uh, have learned how to better, faster manufacture vaccines. We have learned about uh, in a large number of, uh, of uh, people how the immune system uh, reacts uh, uh, towards um, mRNA. Uh, we, uh, and not only we, also regula regulators have uh, learned about uh, um, uh, mRNA vaccines and, and how to deal with uh, them, uh, so that um, uh, this will definitely accelerate also our cancer vaccine. And you said before, I asked you, did you feel a cure for cancer is in your grasp? Uh, yes, we feel that uh, a cure of, uh, uh, for cancer or, or to changing cancer patients' life uh, is in, in our grasp. Uh, you know, scientists are, uh, tend uh, to uh, show humility because uh, nature and biology uh, has so many se uh, secrets and you only find about, uh, out about them when you enter this unknown territory on which we, which we have been navigating since um, uh, three decades now. Yeah? Every step, every, every patient we treat in our cancer trials uh, helps us to find out more about what we are against and how to um, address that. Yeah. Uh, therefore, 
as scientists, we are always hesitant to say we will have a cure for cancer. We have a number of breakthroughs and we will continue to work on them. And what's it like working together as husband and wife? Because you are professor and professor, but husband and wife. It's Do arguments come to the lab or arguments from the lab go home? What happens? It's actually easier than you would think. <laughs> no arguments at all. You never yeah. argue? Oh, we have scientific debates, <laughs> but no arguments. <laughs> um, I must also ask you about um, something else that's happening with a, a court case. BioNTech has been hailed with coming up with a vaccine, but Moderna has saying you've used some of their intellectual property to do so. What's your response to that? We can't publicly comment on that. Okay, but I must ask you that they say you copied two key elements of their international inter intellectual property. Mm -hmm. Do you think that you will be able to fight off that claim? We have made, made uh, an announcement uh, about this and, and I can't comment more than, than we have already said. Yeah? Our innovations are original. Yeah? We have spent 20 years of research in developing this type of treatments and of course we will fight uh, uh, for, 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 for this, for, for our intellectual property. Okay. Professor and Professor, thank you so much for speaking to us. Thank you. Thank you. They're a remarkable couple behind the BioNTech vaccine. A reminder, there's progress and good, exciting things in the world away from what's going on in Westminster, where the wild conservative psychodrama has been answered by the public, not just with a dip, but a crash in the polls for the Conservatives. There is a clear pattern, for now, that shows Labour well on track to win the next election whenever it comes. But is the party doing more than profiting at the Tories' chaos? Well, the man who'd be Labour's business secretary if they win is Jonathan Reynolds, and he's here with us in the studio this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, is the new Chancellor right that the state of the economy is such that there will have to be a squeeze on spending and tax rises? Well, the latest Chancellor, I mean, let's see how long he, he's in position for. I'm not even sure what this government's economic policy is at the moment. I don't know which bits of the budget still apply, and I don't know what we will hear next week. What I would say is any cuts the Conservative Party brings forward are entirely of its own making, entirely because of its own incompetence. And I would just heed any Conservative MP and ask them, where do they think they're going to find cuts? I mean, look at the state of the NHS. Look at the state of the criminal justice system. Look at law and order in this country. I don't think they will find that. Now, we can't make decisions, frankly, until we know what the picture is. It's just speculation at the minute. It is clear that the Conservative Party has not just done terrible damage to, to people's mortgage repayments and to business investment, but to the national finances as well. And of course, precise numbers by where we may be or not in 23 or 2024 when there's a general election, of course, we cannot be sure of that. What we can be pretty sure of, what the people like the OBR, the IFS, all those acronyms, but they're independent, well-respected number crunchers, they are all clear that there is going to be a significant black hole in the country's finances. So I'll ask again, do you accept that there will have to be either a squeeze on spending, potential spending cuts, or tax rises? Look, I can't speculate on that. In our plans, that we already have put but forward. That's a principle I, I, I need to know. I need to know what... I mean, there's newspaper speculation overnight as to what the scale of the damage might be, but you've got to know that before you make decisions. But Jonathan Reynolds, that's, that, that's not speculation about a number here or there. Everybody who's independent, who's looked at the state of the British economy right now, says there's going to be a hole and it's going to have to be filled somehow. So that's a question on principle. Well, Will there have to be a squeeze on spending and tax rises to get us out of this look, mess? In the plans that we've already put forward, we are always clear where we wish to increase day-to-day -day revenue, day-to-day spending, we will increase the revenue that comes in to pay for that. So, for instance, we've said we would abolish the non-DOM rule. That will bring in over mm -hmm. £3 billion. Mm -hmm. We've said we'd tax private equity differently. We have said that private schools wouldn't be charities. But under those are pennies government. when you look at the scale of this well, suggestion. Well, if you, if you I mean, wish to increase spending, well, mm -hmm. we said we want to increase the NHS workforce, we said we want breakfast clubs for young people, we will always identify the expenditure for that. We are absolutely committed to the fiscal rules that Rachel Reeves has put forward mm -hmm. where we will not borrow for day-to-day -day expenditure. We do not believe, you know, we have a completely different economic philosophy to this government as to how growth happens, but also how you pay for things. We don't agree with what they've done, borrowing money for tax cuts. And if there's any doubt, it is the fiscal rules that will win out and apply. And to be clear, that is your rule set by your shadow chancellor, where basically you're not going to spend money on the day-to-day -day stuff we're not going to borrow by money borrowing for in order to do it stuff. we but will borrow to invest as part of our industrial mm -hmm. strategy net zero and getting good jobs but, in it, all parts but of the i country. think it's important though for the audience to under to understand 
where you stand on what the government is actually doing. So there's a suggestion that the government might not <coughs> cut income tax from 20p to 19p. We heard from the Chancellor, everything's on the table. If they do not cut that income tax down to 19p, will you support that? Well, look, our argument on what they brought forward initially has always been that personal taxation is high because growth mm -hmm. has been so poor over the last 12 years. Now, look, we will have to see what they bring forward. Again, we, we honestly don't know what will happen. We'll have to oh. see what the OBR has said. So we'll have to... You know, Ex except, except at your party's conference in Liverpool, Keir Starmer, your boss, said to us very, very clearly that Labour would support cutting that rate of income tax for 20p down to 19p. Yeah, we, we would have, because that is absolutely consistent so will you support with everything government? that we have said. That was before mm -hmm. the Conservative Party set fire to the British economy. Has caused but will you tell us whether or not you will support We them? will as soon as we know what the government is doing and what the OBO forecast is. And we've got to base it on real information, not on speculation. Of I honestly don't know which bits of the budget still apply as we sit here today. What did Keir Starmer mean when he said yesterday we should be clear about what fiscal responsibility, we should be clear about what that means. It means not being able to do things, good labour things, as quickly as we might like. What does that mean? Well, it means that the scale of the damage the Conservative Party has done is evident to personal finances, to, to business finances and to the national finances. Now, look, people know, they don't expect a Labour government can wave a magic wand and fix all these problems overnight and Keir is just being absolutely level and straight with people about that. But what we does have, that mean well, in concrete it means, terms? It means we can't do everything as quickly as we would like because there has been a real and lasting impact on the British economy so of the incompetence and the disgraceful behaviour of the last three weeks. And people know that, but what they want is hope for the future. They want a government that has a real plan for growth, not this trickle-down fantasy that somehow tax cuts for better off people will pay for that. And there is real commitment to public services and to jobs in this country. But people they will, will get that from Labour. But people will hear, though, that you're not as answering that specifically. But it sounds like that message, what Keir Starmer said, basically is a message to design to say, it's going to be tough, we might have to cut spending and we're going to have to put taxes up. No, it's not about talking about any kind of return to austerity, but it is an acknowledgement. When this, the last Labour government left office, we were talking about seeing a GP in, in 48 hours. Now the height of the government's ambition it is two weeks. You can't turn that round overnight. You can't turn around the delays in the criminal justice system overnight. You can't turn, turn around the problems with, you know, getting the police in your area or, or responding to, to crime. But you can have a better plan for the future. You can give people hope for the future. You can make different choices. And that is what people expect from a Labour government, and that's what they will get. But I think I'm struggling to hear you commit to something being very different. So you say you won't tell us whether or not public spending will be squeezed or cut and taxes will have to go up. And I, I notice you, you keep saying we don't know what the government is exactly going to do. But if you can't tell us that central question, whether or not you would cut public spending, aren't people going to be scratching their heads and thinking, well, what is Labour really for? No, because first of all, we can be confident that growth under Labour would be higher because it was higher mm -hmm. under the last Labour government and our plans for the economy are about driving up long-term business investment, long-term industrial strategy, fixing business rates, improving our relationship, our trading relationship with the single market, all things that are real and practical, changes that will improve things and where we want to increase spending, we'll identify where that revenue will come from. That is what people expect. And they, they don't want vague promises. They don't want, you know, a, a sense that you can just turn around the sheer scale of the damage that has been done, not just in the last three weeks, but over the last 12 years. But it does sound like, and people may understand why you don't want to be make specific commitments now because there has been so much turmoil, but it does sound like, both by what Keir Starmer said yesterday and what you're saying this morning, is even if you win the next election, people have to understand that it will be a tough outlook that you will not be able, if you're lucky enough to win, to suddenly do what you would like to. You're not going to turn the taps on and suddenly milk and honey will flow across the land. But no one expects that. They expect a government with a serious plan for growth, which we have. They expect people committed to fiscal responsibility, which we are. They don't expect all the problems to be turned around overnight. Look, the average household is now going to be paying, when they have to remortgage, an extra £500 a month. Of course that has a huge impact on the economy. You, you, can't, you can't turn that around immediately. You can't, you know, once you've lost confidence, which the government have lost the confidence of the people who borrow, who lend money to the government, you can't just turn that around. It takes time to win that 
back. But I'll tell you this, no Conservative can restore the confidence that the government has lost in the last three weeks. It requires a general election and a fresh start and a Labour government to do that. OK, well, they would obviously challenge that, but thank you very much for giving us your views, Jonathan Reynolds. Thank you for coming in this morning. Right now, the time is getting towards 10 o'clock and we've heard some of how Labour says they'd run things differently. But remember, we listened to the new Chancellor earlier and whoever's in charge, maybe the reality of what's happened to the economy, the tricky issues everywhere and what's happened in the last couple of weeks means there are hard times ahead. We are going to have to take some very difficult decisions, both on spending and on tax. Spending is not going to increase by as much as people hoped. And indeed, we're going to have to ask all government departments to find more efficiencies than they had planned. And taxes are not going to go down as quickly as people thought, and some taxes are going to go up. Right, Christina McAneely, you're the head of a big health union, You've got more than a million members. Let's have a reality check. How tough do you think this winter is going to be? It's going to be horrible, quite frankly. Um, but it's not inevitable that it's like that. So we're balloting uh, about 400,000 NHS workers and we'll be working with the other unions that are also balloting. Um, and if we get a yes vote, and we'll get it in some places, then we will be taking members out on strike. Nobody wants that to happen. And as I say, it's not inevitable. The government could talk to us about it. So we, we're in the middle of talks in Scotland with the Scottish government about this. I'm pretty certain that Mark Drakeford in Wales will talk to us about it. Mm -hmm. But we're getting nothing from this government. Uh, you know, they'll find time to go and... What do you mean nothing? Well, they won't talk. I've written to, I've written to um, Liz Truss. We've contacted Therese Coffey's office. Uh, nothing. Um, and, you know, the kind of comments you made the other day there about if nurses don't like it, they should just leave. I don't know whether they're going to magic up all these extra nurses when there's huge shortages. Well, I'm so. sure we'll talk about that in the weeks ahead. Um, John, from what you've heard this morning, um, and I know you follow politics closely, even you're a big businessman, what do you... Do you feel like... Do you feel convinced by either side? Because you took a pretty <coughs> dim, view of, dim, dim view of what's been happening in the Conservatives, but having heard from Johnny Reynolds, are you willing to be persuaded? <coughs> well, I think what both parties need to spell out, because we only really have two choices in this country with our electoral system, is Smaller a very disagree, clear growth say. plan. <laughs> um, and uh, frankly, I don't think we've seen a growth plan from the Conservatives. I hope we will. We have seen the beginnings, I think, of a quite a plausible growth plan from Labour. So at the moment, their ideas are on the table, and many of them are actionable and attractive. And I wait to hear what the, uh, what the government has to say in due course. But at the moment, there's really only one team on the field. But Ancock, final word to you. I mean, are you worried that your party is going to be terribly punished at the next election for everything that's happened? Well, I think it's vital that we sort it out and get ourselves in a position where we can offer hope for the future. You know, you've seen blamange from the Labour Party and the threat of strikes that would only get worse. And so it's in the national interest that we pull together. We put in place that plan that, that John was mentioning and that I've been calling for. And we have a credible, positive, optimistic plan that can take advantage of the many positives some, some that are going on Some people might prefer blamange to the chaos they've seen from your party in the last couple of weeks. Well, it's, it, it, it's incumbent on us to pull it together, to sort it out, to have that plan and to offer that hope for the future. And I'm okay. absolutely confident we can do that, mm -hmm. but we need to make it happen. Okay, well, testing times ahead all round. Thank you all three of you so much Thank for you. coming in this morning. It's been great to have your thoughts. Now, we began by asking who's in charge of the country. And when I asked the new Chancellor if it was him or his boss, he said, maybe not that comfortably, that it was the Prime Minister. But he said too very clearly that Liz Truss has changed. Quite something to hear when she's only a few weeks into the job. But the most extraordinary thing was the new Chancellor junking most of the Prime Minister's plan for the economy. The one she told us about in this studio only a few weeks ago. The one she stood by again two weeks ago in Birmingham. The platform that got her elected by the membership of her party just in the summer. But as the markets have battered the government's reputation, her credibility has been stretched to breaking point, as has been made clear in the studio here this morning. The Prime Minister might hang on, don't be too quick to write her off. But whether she can stay in number 10 may not be down to her, but the markets, her colleagues, her critics, maybe her Chancellor, and of course, all of you. So the answer to our question this morning of who is in charge, as we say goodbye, it's not the Prime Minister on our own. As ever, you can catch up on anything you missed on the iPlayer, and there's tons more on BBC Online. We will definitely be here this time next week, I'm not sure how much else we can know. But thank you so much for being with us this morning. Goodbye.